Oh, gosh, look at that. It's five past ten. Our talkback lawyer, David Whiting, is not robed, but appears before the full court of talkback this morning. 1300 222 774 to help you with free legal advice. 1300 222 774. David was absent last week because he had far more pressing matters to attend to. Um, does Mr. Whiting appear? He does. He did. Uh, last week was my daughter's admission in the Banco Court at the Supreme Court, so it was fantastic. Admission as a barrister and solicitor of this honourable court? No, not no more. Oh, really? What It else? used to be barrister, solicitor and officer of this honourable court. Yes. It's now Australian lawyer and officer of this honourable court. All right. And, uh, was, and your and application, so. was your application successful? It was, thank goodness. I don't know that I could have gone home if it wasn't. <laughs> but it went very well. And then, you know, you have the usual lunch. And, yes. Uh, yeah, it was great. Excellent. Took the whole day off. Congratulations to you and to Marie and, of course, to your daughter as well. Meanwhile, the Court of Appeal, in similarly constituted form, no doubt, had their hands full in deciding that um, politicians can scandalise the court but not not be charged with contempt. I was a bit disappointed here. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I was more interested in the first session than the second session. And uh, my view... Sorry, you mean your daughter's admission rather no, than No, 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 I don't mean I'm the two the two. Oh, the uh, first appearance before, before, the, before the, solicitor, the Solicitor General coming in and not apologising. Yes, I had expected that as a result of that there would have been a, a referral to the DPP and quite likely a prosecution for contempt. You and me together, and even though I might say we have not conferred on this in any way whatsoever. I thought when they refused to apologise, well, that's it. They don't know how much trouble they're in and they're in for a bit of a shock here. Well, had they been convicted, their seats would have become vacant. Even if they'd been charged, they would have been forced to stand down, surely. Uh, no, it's, I think it's the conviction that uh, counts, not that, the... To the seat in Parliament. Sorry, they would have had to stand down from the Ministry if you're charged with contempt of court. Can you continue as a Minister of the Crown? I would have thought not. No, well, I, you know, if I was a Minister of Crown, John, I wouldn't have thought I would have made the statements that would have caused me to get there. Yeah. Um, look, we have a terribly interesting balance of power between the, the court system the executive and the parliament, and I think the balances are really, really important. Um, uh, in a sense, I, you know, you, the court, the court tells the, the the parliament if they think they've got it wrong, and uh, but to, in a sense, uh, make statements that, on the face of it, would be for the purpose of endeavouring to get a particular outcome or a more, uh, you know, influencing the outcome. That to me is something you just don't do. In particular, three politicians, each of them who are uh, uh, admitted as barristers, solicitors and officers of the court. In fact, Greg Hunt, I was reminded by someone, had been associate to Michael Black, the chief judge of the federal court, and would have sat for at least one or two years, I would have thought, in the federal court watching proceedings closely and should have been well-schooled in what you do and don't say. So there you go. It... um, It's never a good thing, but at least it's been resolved. Uh, We've lost two significant members of Melbourne's legal profession in the last week. Former Chief Magistrate Michael Adams, whose tenure was um, clouded by a little bit of political controversy, but then went on to a long and successful career back at the bar. And former Supreme Court Judge Alan MacDonald also has died after a long illness. I I remember Alan MacDonald, a lovely man. And, uh, I mean, I never appeared before him in a judicial capacity. That, That might have been slightly different. But uh, he was also on the MCC committee for a long period of time. And uh, I was a party to a number of mediations that he conducted after he retired from the Supreme Court. Yes, so we pay tribute to both of them. Anything else that's news in the legal system? Well, there's there's a couple of things. Uh, uh, Last week when I wasn't here, we talked about change. There was a discussion about changes to the road rules. You know, this one of uh, slowing down to 40 kilometres per hour when you you see uh, an emergency vehicle with uh, lights and what the consequences of that might be. So I wandered off to read the road rules, as one does from time to time. Oh, you get all the the exciting jobs. And what would you call the, the, what are the tree plantings in St Kilda Road between the service road and where the trams are? Uh, I mean, it's clearly so not a median so between, strip. So if you think... Uh, between by, the, there's a service road and then there's the main carriageway, which includes the tram tracks. Yes. And in between, there's a grass strip with trees in it. Yes. What's that called? Well, well, it's not. A, it was clearly not a median strip because the median strip covers only only divides vehicles going in different directions. Wow! Um, so they're under the road rules. So if you are tootling down St Kilda Road at 
the speed limit and you see an emergency vehicle in the service lane on your side of the centre ro- centre point of the road. So with, not on the same part of the road as you, on the other side of the grass yes. in the service road. I'm sorry, then the answer would be on any of you, you are approaching them because you're not getting further away from them. You must be approaching them. Well, they're approaching you. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, no, I think it's just, you've got to, this is when they're stationary. I see, right. Um, the expectation is is that uh, it affects vehicles in what I would describe as a different carriageway. It's not, um, the legislation doesn't define that particular plantation as being a, a median strip. Hmm, so I think that's a sort of issue. And the silly one I found is they've changed the Mikey ticketing regulations. And what it says in the new regulations, Regulation 19, is that you can't uh, transfer your Mikey ticket to someone after you've started to use it. So the question arises is when do you start to use a Mikey ticket that's valid, valid at, you know, say for a couple of years? Mm-hmm. I would have thought it was after you got it, not for the trip you're using it for. So um, I always keep a spare Mikey card in the event that I'm travelling with someone who might need one and doesn't have one. Under my view, reading of the regulations, you can't lend it to them anymore. Um, but that's just me being picky. John, I had two pieces of homework from last week. One was from... Um, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Uh, Maureen from Coburg, who had some issues in relation to a commercial development that was very, very close to her home. Yes. Uh, Maureen actually rang me, and it involves a, uh, a substantial development where the developer took the matter to VCAT twice and lost twice. Uh, because there was a restrictive covenant on the div- in the area that prevented anything other than a single dwelling, and it wasn't a single dwelling. Um, so that would go back to when the land was first subdivided? Well, which was uh, in 1913 and 1920 in the particular right. area. And what happened was uh, is that they've been using the area as a car park, they now want to build on it, and um, off, to, off the council says no, go to VCAT, VCAT says no, go back to council as, uh, and the council again says no. They then The developer then persuades the minister to remove the single building covenant. What? Minister removes the single building covenant. Sorry, you buy in at a cheap price because there's a covenant. No, no, let's be really honest. It's the redevelopment of the John Faulkner Hospital in Moreland Road. Yes, they but were using way. They were using two properties in a side street as a car park yeah. and they wanted to expand the development substantially. Right. And so they go to council. Council says no. Go to VCAT. VCAT says, sorry, single building covenant. Full stop. Can't allow you to, can't give you permission to so do something. So the hospital is wanting to use the car park. Well, no, I assume they want to rebuild. They want to intensify the development, build yeah. some more. But it's the hospital that wants to do it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. So okay. they're buying the house next door, which has got a covenant on it. No, no, saying... they've already bought the land. Yeah. They've had yeah. the land for since 1988 or earlier. Yeah, and they're saying, can we now develop it? Yep. Yes, okay. and the council says no. VCAT says no. Back to, uh, they can then get the minister to amend the permit and to um, to remove the covenant. Yep, so it's uh, not a private developer, it's a hospital. It is a private, it's privately a owned hospital. Sure. And uh, so it gets uh, then um, then they get knocked back at council when they go back and they said, look, you've really only given us what you gave us two years ago. So uh, council again says no. Matter then goes to the minister who sets up a panel, and in 2015 the permit was granted. Now Maureen's query was in relation to noise, and which she was saying that the council was in fact breaching their local rules because the there is a local law that talks about no building development yep. on a commercial or industrial site, which is anything other than residential, um, uh, on the weekend outside the period of 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and they're starting at 7. Uh, the problem, if from Maureen's point of view, is that it's possible for them to get a permit from council to start work at any time of the day or night because the regulation says must not without a permit. So, Maureen, I'm afraid... You're, the, what you put to me a couple of weeks ago was that they were doing this without, they were breaching the local laws. But they've got permits. Well, the local laws say without, if you're doing this, if you don't, you can do this without a permit. If you get a permit, presumably it's whatever the permit says. And we had Lorraine from Ballarat whose parents had fallen on a tram as a result of what they saw, or they were jolted. And the question is, could they get pain and suffering? The answer would be... You know, as I suggested, it really depends upon the extent of the injuries and probably not. All right, let's get to today's callers and in Eltham. Malcolm, you're first. Oh, good day. Yes, um, my, my issues around, I've been in a relationship for just over 12 years and um, uh, I own my own house. I owned it about five years before that relationship began. Um, 
And my partner moved into that house with me about four years ago. And um, it seems like we, you know, we're, we may be finishing our relationship. Yes. And I'm wondering if she has any claim on my house. After four years of cohabiting in a 12-year relationship? Yes. Okay. Thank you, I'm, Malcolm. I'm going to put it as possibly because you haven't given me any more information. Oh, I it's, can. It's, it's a question yeah. of needs. It's a question of yeah. contribution. Yeah. On on one view, um, so the relationship between that you had for the previous eight years, did you each have your own properties? Uh, I lived in this property. Yes. Uh, she rented somewhere else. Okay, and then she ultimately moved in with you. So yes. the question that you would need to say is, does she get her rights based on the four years of cohabitation, or yes. are we going to do it on the 12 years that we've known one another? Yes. And the probable answer is it's the four, not the 12. Okay. And then the question will be, what kind of contributions has she made to what you've got? Yes. All right? Well, 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 but she may... the starting yes. proposition is, is that if you were to get back what you walked into the relationship with, you would get the property back. Yes. And okay. the question is then, to what extent might that need to be adjusted because of circumstances that are peculiar to the two of you? Okay. What sort of circumstances are we talking about? Well, um, you, there might be a need issue. I mean, somebody's uh, uh, too sick to work. They might have retired and not have superannuation. So age all and all sorts of things would come into it. But the general proposition is you start from the proposition that you get the property back. I presume you haven't had children together? No, children, no. no. All right. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with that. Uh, Collis you. in Mentone is next through to David. Morning to you, Collis. Hello, John. Hello, David. Um, look, this is just with regard to my daughter. She, uh, she bought an off-the-plan apartment um, about two years ago uh, for four... 465000 and about a year ago a rather large development company took over the development because yes. the original developer um, couldn't sell all the prop you know couldn't sell all the apartments on on the property yes um, so anyway she's um, she's had a deposit tied tied up with this development company now for nearly two years yes and what they're trying to do, they've, they've said they've had to redesign the property and they're losing an apartment from upstairs or some damn thing. And so what they're trying to do, they're trying to, you know, what I think is, is to bludge another $60,000 out of her. Uh, in return for what? Well... In return, basically, for a redesign of the building, they said that they said that she's she's getting ex, extra meterage, but in a, in effect, that's not true because apparently there was two balconies or two sort of living areas yes. at, outside, so uh, that is being reduced. Um, Collis, what you you have rights, or your daughter has rights under the Sale of Land Act. Yes, and the and the contract condition will probably say something along the lines that if the developer thinks it's necessary for the development, or it re results from a town planning or other requirement, then they have the ability to amend the plan. Yes, uh, and in the event that it makes a change, a more than nominal change, to the uh, the unit that your daughter is buying then or it might or something else in the development adversely affects it she has the ability to walk from the contract right so um what does be, nominal mean well that's the problem john nobody quite knows what what nominal is um uh, so if you want to get out you'll say well that's more than nominal if they want to keep you in they'll say no it's only nominal and who resolves that where do you go uh mm. well it's a just you know the answer is it's the courts that resolve the issue which court do you go to vcat or no you know it would be a Supreme would, court. yeah the answer would be i'm sorry you've uh, oh, right. yeah. so you have rights under the sale of lax land act but your rights are to exit the contract yes uh it, well i suppose your first argument is is that the changes don't need to be made yeah, and therefore yeah, well, they don't have the benefit of the clause. But your starting proposition needs to be a detailed analysis yes. of its sections 9A and following in the Sale of Land Act. And, 9A. Yeah, 9A, and, but, uh, 9A to 9D, I think it is. Right. And you then need to look at the precise wording of the clause. I see. And that will tell you what your daughter's rights are. 
can she hold them to the contract or does she have the right to go? Right. All right. right. Yeah, look, my, my um, uh, solicitor said, well, look, you know, you, you can fight it, but, you know, there's a possibility we, we could lose it. Is that true? There always yeah. is in any court case, Collis. Yes. There are no guarantees whenever you go near litigation. Yeah, yeah. If there were guarantees, then whichever party was there guaranteed be not to win wouldn't really? be litigating. So yeah. Yeah, right. the reason it's litigated is because both sides have been told they've got a fair chance of winning. Yeah, right, right. Uh, it's a big development company. Yeah, I'm just really disappointed for my daughter, you know. the Understand, yeah. particularly as property prices will have gone up in the two years and she's lost opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, they're saying, you know, they're going to market it at 560. Yeah, she might even have a capital gain to offset what the extra charges mm, are. Mm. All righty. All right, all right. Well, thanks. It's, for, thanks it's, for, it's a thanks commercial calls. decision as much as a legal one, I think, is what David's saying to you. Yes. All righty. Yeah, thanks very much. Good on you. Faye and Taylor's Lakes. Thanks. Morning to you, Faye. Good morning. Yes, welcome. Okay. You're, you're through to David. Thank you. Um, I've just got an issue with a housing contract. Uh, we sold our house in February this year. So this is a contract for the sale of land, or is it a building contract? Of, uh, no, building yes. contract, a house. A, 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 so it's a, a building house, contract. A yes, that's yes. right. Yes, okay. No, no, we, no we, we, we've been living in the house for 30 years. We sold our house, and we bought another house. Yes. So we want, which we want to move into. Yep. So after Sorry, Faye, first, we do need to clarify this. You've bought a house and yes. the land, is what we're talking about. No, no, about. no. It's nothing to do with the land. It's a house that's been... Sta- uh, uh, so you're buying house. an existing property and your uh, question's existing. in relation to your purchase contract. Yes, exactly. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. So, so after March 30, we found the house that we wanted and we signed the contract at the end of, the mar- end of March. Now, the contract, um, the negotiations took three days and then we paid our deposit. Two weeks after we signed the contract, we had our deposit for two weeks. They then decided, we got a letter from their solicitor stating that the vendors did not want to sell and um, stating that the agent had forced them to sign a blank contract. We responded that the contract, as far as we were concerned, that the contract was valid and we wanted to continue with the purchase. Yes. Then a week later, we received another letter um, stating that they were offering us $4,000 in cost to break the contract um, and again, we refused. As, as by this time, the prices of the houses were soaring, yes. and we realised that we wouldn't be able to find a similar house at a similar price. So then we heard nothing more. So where are you? Bought... Where are you at now, Faye? So basically, we we um, uh, we were actually forced to rent because we. No, had, no, where, we when is property. settlement under your contract? Settlement has taken place. No settlement on your purchase. Oh, when yeah. is it due? It, it was due on the twenty third of June. Right, and did Last you week. did you tender? Did you turn up with a cheque? Have you done any of those things? We, we tried all that. Yes, and we, and we just uh, their, their solicitor sent a letter stating there is um, uh, Faye. Are mm-hmm. you are you familiar with a website called Ostly? No. Um, a U S T L I. No, I'm not aware of that. No, well, I, if you write, got a pen and write it down, yes, Ostly dot edu dot au. Yes. And there was a. Um, uh, an interesting and uh, a Victorian Supreme Court decision earlier this year yep. in relation to a what I'll describe as a similar fact situation to what you're describing, mm-hmm. and it is um, and it relates to a property in Plumpton, which is out west right. between yep. uh, Sydenham and Taylor and uh, Milton, yep. and the fact situation that you're talking about is there. Look at the analysis in that, yes, okay, and the question the question there will be. That the vendors, the ven, the court found that the vendor signed the contract voluntarily and should be held to it. Yes. Okay. So have a look yes. at that. Yeah. Uh, have a look at the. Have a talk to the agent, and the question: What you're then doing is you're issuing proceedings for specific performance yes. to compel the vendor to complete the transaction. Okay. So have a look at the case. Uh, you. Ostly, could you just spell it to me again? Ostly, could you, Ostly, could you spell- A-U-S-T-L-I-I. L-I-I. Dot edu you. dot au. Yep. The menu on the left-hand side, go to Victoria, go to Supreme yep. Court, and then in recent cases, search on Plumpton, and okay. you'll find a, a fascinating analysis of the process for, for valuing properties and whether the vendor agreed or didn't agree. Interesting one. It does sometimes happen, not often, David, but it does still happen. No, we've had a couple of calls from people who were in the position of the vendor saying, mm. I didn't really want to. Yeah, and, and how can I get out of it? Andrew in Greensboro. Morning to you, Andrew. Uh, good morning, John. Good morning, David. 
Um, my dad was very upset yesterday. He received three bills from Centrelink, totalling around 4,700, and one of them was for my uh, mother, who passed away in 2014 in March, uh, yes. for 1,900. Um, they sent it to dad as executor, and I'm just wondering, can they make any claim this late on? I mean, all, he was the main recipient of everything, but... Um, well, uh, let don't. me ask you a different yeah. question, uh, yeah. Andrew. What did your mother have in her own name when she died? It was um, about $200,000, I think. In, in her own name? Yes. Yeah, probate was for about that amount. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the general proposition... Well, there's, there's two answers to the question. Uh, the normal prospect of the process is that an executor can lodge an advertisement in the Government Gazette and a paper under Section 33 of the Trustee Act and can then distribute the estate after 60 days having regard only to the notices to to claims of that that have been filed by that time. Within the 60 days? Yeah, so, yeah. so it's in a sense, you know, you can't do it until you've got probate, then you lodge the ad and you can distribute the estate. Uh, well, you've got the, the possibility of a challenge to the will, but apart from that, you only need to worry about claims that come in in that time. Now, my guess is that your dad didn't didn't lodge the ad. Most no, the only ad was for the one... Um, well, it goes on the website for, for the probate, yeah. yes, right? But, I mean, but the general proposition is also that those notices... Your, your, your dad's defence is, is that the estate has been fully administered and see where you go from there. Okay. There is nothing left in the estate to repay this amount. First of all, is it yeah. actually... Do you think it's a fair assessment of money's owing, Andrew, or is well, that... There... That's the other thing. With all these three, it's just you've been overpaid because your income was too much and there's no other information at all. This is yeah. for stuff going back 2011. Yeah. Um, so this so, is one of those robo-debt claims, yeah, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. I've got... Uh, I mean, I have all Dad's information, although it's hundreds and hundreds of pages and all sorts of files, but I've got no way to check... And that's what, what they claiming. count on. A lot of people are so spooked they just pay. Mm. A lot of other people go, well, that's too hard, and put it in the too hard basket, and the next thing they find is that the uh, Centrelink debt collection process moves on. So uh, in this instance, David's advice is to write back and say, here's a the, photocopy, the estate's fully okay. administered. Here's a photocopy of the death certificate. Uh, she's been dead for this long, and the estate's fully administered. Um, fully administered. Go what, away, what, please. What about the fact the advertisement is to inform people? They were informed directly of her death. Does that count for anything? Well, I'd make that point. Well, I, way, I, you, yeah, I would certainly make... Well, because her pension would have stopped. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So they already knew. So I'd just come along and say, look... Yeah, had you wanted it, you should have come back to us two years ago. You didn't. And, yeah. and we dispute yeah. whether it's actually due anyway, so yeah. go away. Okay. All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. luck. Okay. Bye Kate bye. and Ballarat, morning to you, Kate. Good morning, David and John. I'm just wondering about defamation or slander or whatever. Um, There's no difference it? anymore. There's the, the difference between lab, libel and slander is gone, sadly. Yeah. Well, if somebody overhears somebody saying that they're... Uh, what happened? What happened, Kate? Oh, it was busy just before Christmas. I got off the bus, walked along, and it was pretty busy. And a, a man was coming towards me, sort of with his arms outstretched, sort of gorilla-like. And I thought, oh, he's a bag snatcher. So I moved to the other side of the footpath and realised he was with a woman doing the same thing. So then I went into the news agent and um, overheard uh, the one shop assistant say to the other that, I was a shoplifter, but I was too upset to uh, do anything about it. So uh, then the third time that they searched my bags in another, you know, over a few weeks, I said, what's all this paranoia about old people with walking frames? And the shop assistant said, oh, you do. You take heaps of stuff, you old people. Yes. <laughs> you feel defamed, do you, Kate? Well, I do because... It's not definitely not true. <laughs> well, it's, what you're telling me is it's not true in respect of you. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm not wanting to denigrate people who do or don't have walking frames, but we're all very good at extraordinary generalisations. Yes, well, a couple of older people I know the same things happened, and one was quite suicidal because she just lost a couple of family members, you know. And I just want an explanation. Please explain why I say that, you know, that... Yeah, that's they... not the same as defamation. Um, you know, the, the, the first statement at Christmas time between the two shop assistants might well have been, but, um, you know, I, I, 
I actively discourage people from commencing defamation proceedings. They are hideously expensive, often quite difficult to prove, and the difficulty will be proving what your loss is. Kate, um, I mean, what effectively is it's they've hurt your feelings rather than your reputation in the minds of other people is what uh, what's at my stake here? Because I was quite well, I felt quite well respected, and every yeah. It, but but I no one's like, has anyone crossed you off their party invitation list because of what was said to you in the shop that day. Well, it has had repercussions. Uh, where? Oh, just in the community. A couple of times I've come up against changed. Um, so, so is this a no? No, you've got to think this through, though, uh, Kate. Is this a comment? Uh, are we talking about? Comments that, you know, the generalisation in the third place you went to or the specific proposition in relation to your behaviour in the first incident. And in the first incident, yes, you've got a claim. You might well like to go and talk to you, ask to see the manager of the store and have a discussion there to set it right. But let's not talk about defamation proceedings without incredibly deep pockets because if you sue the shop assistant for defamation, I'm prepared to bet your shop assistant won't have the money to withstand the onslaught and Kate would or be satisfy up the judgment. Tens and tens of thousands of dollars worth of legal costs if yes. she wanted to proceed yes. any further. So it might be best just to have a chat to them, Kate, and say, look, do you realise how much that offends me when I hear you saying things like that about me? Good luck with that, Kate. Can we squeeze a few more in after the oh, news yeah, headlines, sure. David? That would be terrific. Our talkback lawyer, David Whiting, taking a few more calls after the news headlines. 27 minutes, it's nearly 26 minutes to 11. More of your calls shortly on the open line, but with David Whiting, our talkback lawyer, let's grab a few more before we force David, just force him to do a bit more work this morning because he wasn't here last week. We'll try and catch up on a few more calls. And then after the open line, a special forum on philanthropy and donations and charities and giving. A lot of people find charities, well, they don't trust them the way they used to. And apparently there's a bit of compassion fatigue underway at the moment Can I in say, our John, country. M- my observation is that the generation of givers is dying out. Yep, maybe. So, you know, they're... I come from a generation which isn't nearly as, nearly as generous as the generation above us. I think it was Dick Smith who made a speech at a philanthropy conference and said they went through and the um, 100 highest income earners in the tax office, top 100 league, um, some staggering proportion, something like 80% of them, didn't claim deductions for donations to charities, even though they were earning millions of dollars. Wouldn't surprise me. And yet in the United States or Europe, for instance, that would be... Apparently, yeah, they have a culture of endowment. Completely different, completely different. Uh, back to your calls, 1300 222 774. Kay in Sunbury. Morning to you, Kay. Oh, good morning. Hello, Kay. Hello there. Um, I've just got a question. I need some advice on which direction to take. Um, I was recently uh, went through the magistrate's court as a sex abuse survivor. Yes. Um, the perpetrator was found guilty but received no conviction. Um, I've approached a specialist legal company and they've advised me to approach the investigating detective to apply for an application for an asset investigation. Um, the investigating detective said it's not their job to do so, so I'm just wondering who do I get in contact with for that next step? Okay, did you try Crimes Compensation Tribunal, or if it was one of the churches, they all have schemes for compensation? No, no, it was a, a private... The, private matter, OK. The, the, the problem, John, is that the lawyers that... that uh Kate has gone to Kay has gone to see, are are really trying to find out whether this person has assets from mm. which a, a judgment or order might be satisfied. Sure. Yes. Um, and there is that that would normally be something that you would do. It's normally something that a plaintiff would do to work out whether or not if they got a judgment, that judgment could be satisfied. Before you spend the money. So how do you find out whether someone has assets or not? Well, there are, are. It's privacy gone mad. We're not allowed to, we're not supposed to know what people own. Um, what you can do is you can do a title search on the property he lives in, and find out whether he owns it. Now that might be a starting point. Does that help, Kay? Uh, no, because I, I don't know where this person lives. Um, 
So I, I'm just wondering why a, a large legal firm would, would say there's a, a, an area within the police that do this, uh, that have um, access to this information. And there, there, there is an area in the police that tracks proceeds of crime and they deal with the confiscation of assets that constitutes the proceeds of crime. But that's not what this is here. It's, no. what, what you're talking about here is that you want to engage the police as private investigators at the police's cost to determine whether there are assets against which a judgment might be satisfied. Now, that's not going to work. My, my guess is, is that you're talking to a firm who operates a no-win, no-fee. Yes. And so what they're saying to you is, look, we're, I guess, we're satisfied that we can get a judgment... But there's no point us doing this if at the end of the day that judgment's not going to be satisfied. Now, you can go to the um, electoral office and you can look at the electoral roll and see if the person's address appears there. And it can probably we go the will. other way with this, David? Kay, what about crimes compensation? There's a scheme where there's a taxpayer-funded scheme to compensate the victims of crime. It's not as um, uh, lucrative. It doesn't well, it's a, generate just the same amounts. Smaller money, yeah. It gives you smaller amounts, but you would get something if the crimes... Is it still the case, David, as long as it's reported to the police? Yes. And you suffered an injury? Then you can have compensation. Then you can claim including compensation. Including pain and suffering. But it's, it's, there's a cap to it, Kate, okay? so it's not a huge amount of money. Yep. All right? And it doesn't prevent you taking the matter further. And it doesn't cost you anything to access the crimes compensation tribunal. Elements. And they, okay? they're down at VCAT. Okay. So start there, Kate. Okay. Uh, yeah. So look, I'm none the wiser with how to go about asset investigation. Really, do I need to get a? Um, do I need to? Okay. Starting point is this: go and have a look at the. Um, because of, you've got his address, haven't you? It'll be on the material provided by the court, by the uh, by the police when you were subpoenaed. So if you get a copy of the information filed by the police, it will have the defendant's name, his date of birth and his address. You're then able to do a title search on the address to see if he owns it or he doesn't own it. And if there's a mortgage or not? Yes. Now that will give you a starting point. All right, Kate. Good. Thank you very much. Right. Good luck with that. And Vanessa and Rosanna, oh, just an, an update. We had our caller before the news concerned about being accused of being a shoplifter because she's yes. an elderly woman using a walking frame, which have baskets often yes. attached to them. Uh, Kate in Geelong, who runs a shop, says, uh, I work for a major retailer. It's mothers with prams, not the elderly with walking frames. Mothers with prams that pinch the most, according to Kate in Geelong. Ooh. Okay. Okay. It's I think you're going to get some more text messages. Uh, it's, on that yeah, job. it's getting pretty willing. Vanessa and Rosanna, go ahead. You're through to David. Oh yes, that's a very quick one. Good morning. Um, just um, I've just been asked recently by um, <clears throat> a colleague to be an executor of her will. Now, excuse my ignorance. I'm not exactly sure um, if this person um, does. Um, if this has to be activated, at what point? Am I responsible for things that she might possibly have debts or is it just to oversee the will? She actually um, does have other family members but has specifically asked me. And I'm a little v bit apprehensive. V Vanessa, there are things... The, the state trustees and other trustee companies have disclosure material on their websites that talks about what an executor does. Yes. But broadly speaking, it's your obligation to arrange the funeral and dispose of the body. Um, although when I get the job, it's normally in conjunction with family members. It's rare that the executor does it on their own. Uh, then it's a collection of the assets, the payment of the liabilities, and the dispersal of the balance in accordance with the terms of the will. Can an executor end up with debts from being right. trustee no, of an executor? No, the exec no, the answer is if there isn't enough money then what you do is you administer the estate in insolvency. You're never personally liable for things other than you contract for. So there's a series of priorities. The costs of administration come out first. The funeral costs come out second. Uh, the liabilities are paid from residue. To the extent the residue isn't available, they're paid from specific allocations of assets other than land and after that they're paid from specific allocation of land assets. It's a serious so, responsibility to take on though, Vanessa. Yeah, thank you, John. I, could I just, um, yeah, I totally, uh, that's why I wanted to ring and sorry my ignorance about what it exactly means. I mean, I haven't come across this before, but what was that um, website? David, well, have a look at State Trustees. Or the law, trustees. Or the law yeah. Handbook has a very good chapter on, on estates as well. In and that's lawhandbook.net.au. 
That's law the Fitzroy, handbook. the Fitzroy Sorry. Legal Service okay. Law Handbook. Which, which, one get? Yeah, which is published online now as well as in every library or in bookshops. So the trustee company websites will basically be pre- presenting it to you on the basis is this is why you should use us. Um, and they charge considerably for the service. And the law handbook has a chapter on how you can do it yourself or why you might not need to use a lawyer depending on how complicated the estate's affairs actually turn out to be. Yeah, thank you for your time, gentlemen, and uh, great, great advice. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. I mean, it's a very big thing to ask someone to be your executor and for someone who's not a family member to say yes is to take on quite a responsibility. Particularly if there's no interest or benefit. I would say if you're going to ask a stranger what what's in it for them, Yep. particularly as uh, every now and then you come across one where there's extraordinary levels of disharmony in the family and you get caught in the middle. You do, and you're supposed to navigate a path through it, which... Might not be easy, but there's even the nitty gritty, you know, emptying out someone's personal affairs, sorting through the kitchen drawers and knowing what's to go where and people claim a sentimental attachment to a breadboard or something and yeah. you, you had no idea and threw it out and they turn on you and go, oh, but that's that's my breadboard and, and off you go. Uh, and that's my choice. John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really mm-hmm. tricky, really tricky. David, thank you. Thank you, John. Above and beyond today, but that's to punish you for taking last Tuesday off in order to go and move your daughter's admission. (laughs) No, no, no. It's terrific. It was a really exciting day, clearly, for the whole family. David Whiting, our talkback lawyer, and he will be back at the same time next week. Again, apologies if you didn't get through today. David will be here next Tuesday.